Now, Father, I want to thank you. And I'm asking for your spirit to rest upon us, to your grace to rest upon us, to be able to tap into this thing. The church is not something designed by man. It is your own building. It is your own design. You are the one that said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I ask that you will help us to see how you designed the church to be so that we can all come in and fit in in agreement, in alignment with you in fulfilling your purpose and your plan on earth. Thank you, Lord, wonderful Holy Spirit. We submit ourselves to you as you help us establish on earth what has been established in heaven. And the name of the Lord will be glorified. The work of God will be furthered. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There's a course, a Bible school course called Christology. Now, um, if you don't understand this fad mean, you can still survive. But if you don't understand it for salvation, you are not going anywhere. It's the study about Jesus Christ. His birth, his life, and his work on the cross down to his second coming. There is a specialized study on the second coming of Christ. But this one, ecclesiology, you know ecclesia. Ecclesia, uh, S-I-A. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. You remember that? Church is a called out people. So ecclesiology is the study of the church. Theology. That is the one that if you don't understand, people will have some problems. You will. That particular course For example, one of the things you deal with there is the mission and purpose of the church. One of them is church government. These are causes. This is the one that I want to look at. But the mission and the purpose of the church is so critical for what church government deals with the structure, the hierarchy, the government of this body of people called the church, the called out people. The church is to the present day plan of God. That's the New Testament plan of God. What Israel was to the Old Testament plan of God. The Israel is called the church in the wilderness. Never forget that. The Bible is a continue. Don't ever get to the point where you think you can disconnect because you say you are in the New Testament. But what you just need to know is how the principles are now working in the present time. There has been two major covenants. The first group of people called out were the Jews. They were called out of the nation of Egypt, made God special people, given a covenant, and they had a mission on a purpose. They had an assignment. And their assignment was to disciple the nations of the world at that time. 
and they were to take the principles that Moses taught them and disseminate it across, you know, disciple the nations of the world with that. God used to say it this way, Israel is my first son. The reason he said first is because he wanted other nations to follow suit. So today, because God had problem with that covenant, if that covenant was delivering all the result for him, he wouldn't have made a new one. And there would be no need for the church. There will be no need for the church. But the scripture foresaw a long time, even before the old covenant was set up, that a new people are going to come because the scripture foresaw the coming of Christ, his death, and the people that he was going to raise. All of these were prophesied long, hundreds of years before. The church and his mandate clearly listed throughout the scripture, old and new. So that aspect of the study of the church is what I want to show you. It's called church, covenant, church government. There is one called church covenant, but that's not what I'm bothering about, church government. Every time I come among you, I'm going to do my best to study the church with you. Church government. There is something called church covenant. Church covenant. This one is about membership of the church and the obligations. That's what it is. The binding uh, responsibilities of church members. How you become a member and then what are the obligations and uh, the commitments that go alongside with it and even the benefits too that go alongside with it. Just like you know that God gave the church in the wilderness a covenant at Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments. That's how he also gave the New Testament a covenant. If we didn't have it, we won't be serving communion. So let's look at government. I discussed this a lot yesterday, but I want to add two more thoughts. Why don't you show me the scripture? I quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, and um, verse 7. There are diversities of gifts, and I've said you can put manifestations there. And there are translations of the Bible, depending on what you have, that's what you see there. And it's the same spirit. And there are the differences of administration. But the same Lord. And then diversities of operation. So I said if you want to put it in the order of hierarchy, operations come first. Operations is first. Operations, administrations, and manifestations. And God said, is the same God that worketh all in all. And uh, verse 7 said the manifestations. That's what I was telling you about. The part that the Holy Spirit handles is called manifestation. 
of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We have a board that is ruling the universe, is ruling the kingdom of God. We have a government in heaven that has three people. Three people can form a board of a church. Three. You can have more. You can have more. The, that trustees should not be usually, if we are to follow biblical principle, it shouldn't be less than three. It shouldn't be more than twelve. Three people can form the board of a church. Three people, they call the Trinity, are members of this ruling council that is governing the world today. It's governing the kingdom of God. So if you go, you see mani uh, manifestation is directed by the Spirit. Now, even though they are in that place, they also have direct functions on that different levels of government. Telling me that even the three levels of church admin, it's possible for us to pick leadership uh, from the highest level and put them to oversee it. So the father handles operations. Now, what I want to let us know is that what they wrote as operations here is not operations. The operations, uh, you people normally put operations here. It's not that type of operations, the way you use the word in government. What they mean here is government. Some people call it leadership. Hmm? This is administration. Um, let me see another word I can use. Let me use management. I'm just looking for words because all of them are governmental. Remember, all these three are government. But it's uh, to use words to differentiate them because they are in levels is the, is the issue. The secular world today have created board of trustees here for non-profit like churches, board of directors. The secular world has created a management board, management board or management team at this level. They have also created operational team at this level. The human government, secular government, I'm, I'm, even that word, when I use it, I cringe inside me. Because sometime in future, when I start talking on other things now, you see how we're destroying it. That spirituality is in everything, whether it's government or business and all of that. But anyway, let's let's you secular government or government of this world have created the executive arm of government, the legislative arm, and the judiciary, just to be able to. And it is Christian minds like you who read the scriptures that fleshed out those new way of thinking. That's what happened. Okay, so let's talk about types of church government, types. There are three types, three major types.
Okay, the first is called. You remember yesterday I used three words: episcopate, the presbytery, and the diaconate. That episcopate, the episcopal form of government. The second is I use presbytery. You remember that word? Uh -huh. The presbyterian form of government. I use um, a third word, diaconate, which is deacon. Uh, somebody has not invented the, uh, the deacon or the diaconate type style of government. Nobody invented that yet. So if, if they invent it tomorrow, you have uh, four types. But instead of uh, somebody getting up one day and saying the deacons should be ruling the whole church, Another group got up and went to the third, fourth level that I showed you, the late, the late, the congregation, and created the congregational type. Whether you use the word type or form of government, these are the three types of church government that exist. The first is pastoral form of government. This is rule of bishops and pastors or the clergy, if you want, and the clergy. Let me say pastors, or should I say priests, if that is the one. The second is the rule of elders. Anytime you see presbytery, it means elders. The third is the rule of the congregation. Power belongs to the people, or the people. Scripture does not teach that power belongs to the people. The scripture teaches that power belongs to God. Mm, but we know in politics they talk about power belongs to the people. So when you meet the third level, it's the only type there that is not scriptural. The other two, they even derive the form from scripture. Somebody now said, who, the man that invented that, the Presbyterian church uh, runs more of the middle type, the Presbyterian, the rule of elders. Um, but a lot of um, churches, a couple of recently born churches that are not very much back into church history, creations of 19th and 20th century, read the Bible and saw where in Acts chapter 6 Peter, the apostle and the two have said to the people, choose here among yourself seven men that will put over this office. You know Dickens and all that. They read that and they came to the idea that it's actually the people that run the show and so people must be the ones having all the power they can elect. So in this place whether you're a person or you don't last, they give you years. Every two years, there's fresh voting every two years. The number of uh, churches that operate like that, every two years. Some of them have even gone ahead to, okay, I agree that they should form some, because after initially saying, their own belief, the teaching is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And no human being should claim to have authority in the church. 
So they dismantled. It's part of reaction against both Catholic Church, Anglican Church, every form of uh, spiritual order. They preach a lot of things against it. And they are still are around. They are in Nigeria. A, one of the group in Nigeria is the Brethren. They have also fragmented into different... Because after a while, they start having problems. What normally happens is that those ministries who stay for a while, they go out of existence. Because it's like a headless system. Then there were a few of them that actually mushroomed. So after a while, they start having problems. And when they start having growth producing problems, they need some form of leadership. So finally, they say, okay, let's elect elders. But we, the people, retain the power. So we can sack them anytime we like. They are accountable to us and all of that. When the elders make it, they bring it to us, the people, and there are a lot of problems in it. But what is beautiful is that um, what they get right, and that's the only thing to me that they actually get right, it's a very important element of church life that they get right is the priesthood of all believers. They emphasize it. Every believer is a priest. But their problem is misinterpreting that to mean everyone is in government, in church government. You see? Everyone is a priest. Meaning that we can all, we are all ministers, we are all kings and priests and other. That's one thing they get right. And so they encourage everybody to get involved in the service of God. That's all. But by destroying divine order, they create bigger problems that they usually cannot handle. <laughs> okay. The second, which is Presbyterian, is scriptural. To have elders over every local congregation. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. The only problem it has is that when you have elders, you need leadership among them. That's what they've read that you should ordain elders in every church. Everywhere, elders should be ordained. And you always see it throughout the Bible, uh, New Testament Bible. But they seem to think that once you have a group of people in charge of a church, that is it. What they got right, I also want to emphasize, is the concept of plurality of leadership. Just be taking note so that you will see what I'm pointing out. What is right in the second part is plurality. That you need a team of leaders over God's church not just one man. They are right on that particular concept. That throughout the New Testament and throughout the principles of the scripture, you will find that Moses, the elders of Israel, King David, the elders of Israel, you're always reading that throughout the Bible. Then you get into the New Testament, you start hearing the elders of the church, which are among you. Da, 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 da. It's everywhere and it's correct. What they missed is headship. An example is to build a football team. You have done a wonderful job of having 12 men. Don't give them captain. Don't give them coach. Leave them and see how they will function. You don't build anything like that. An example is, look at, let me give you, for your consumption, look at structures. I'll give you three. I will block this a little. Just think about a vehicle. Remember that structure organization is a vehicle carrying the vision and the people to their destination. So Domino City is a vehicle. It is not the ministry. The organization itself is not the ministry. It is a structure 
that is helping the ministry get accomplished. Yeah, think about these three types of vehicles flying in the air or moving through water or even on land. One is this. And it's moving this way. The other is this. And it's moving this way. The final part is this. Now, watch your father, the almighty God. See how he does leadership. And you can also design another one like this. And let's assume you want the body to be bigger. Like in the case of shark. Watch your father that designed this universe. Watch shark. Watch whale. From where, watch your ego. Eh? Then finally, watch your aircraft. It's your, your father, the creator, that designed those things. Because every structure moves through a medium. If you're moving through air, if you don't know that air is a medium, that is, that is a resistance to, your, to that movement. If you are passing through water, you don't know that there is also resistance. The water itself is a medium. If you are moving through land, that there is also both air and friction on the land resisting you. So if the structure does not have penetration, whether it's decision making, whether it's for so many things, you're going to have problems. So what the Presbyterians did is that they got eldership here. Eh? They cut off. What they did is they just destroyed this part and said they don't want, they want this group to be leading it. Now, think about an aircraft like this or a shark like this or anything at all. You just divide the aircraft from somewhere in the body and level it and then put it on air to move and see what will happen. Not only that it can't lift, but if it does, it crashes everybody in it. That's how a headless system is. Their problem is that they were reacting against the papacy, you know, the Rome, uh, the authority of the Pope and all that, where they were teaching that at one time that Pope is infallible and all those kind of things. So some people in the reaction now went completely against the divine order. It's like where a family where a man is abusing his wife, is beating his wife, maybe has even used his wife for ritual murder. In your reaction now, so that you now create democracy or you create women leave or you create no leadership at all. We are all equal. Children, of course, there are some societies that are doing it. Go and see how things are in that place. It's very important that you understand these things. Because the crazy people are still on earth. These people are not even the crazy ones. The ones that are congregationalists are, is a complete, that's like a family where the children run. Always remember that anytime you want to understand the church and even its structure, you have to look at the home. Never forget that. So if aircraft does not have this pointed end and there is usually a man there assisted by another man, today you either say general overseer assisted by assistant general overseer or president assisted by the vice president, at that point, 
with those, those small eyes, like the eyes of the ego, to lead the vision, to lead the direction, why the rest of the crew help him, then they carry the rest of the passenger, we are going to have problem because you will not be able to, the air will come and hit this thing and it will not be able to penetrate. When you build your kite, for example, you notice that to fly a kite, you design it to go on the edges. Eh? Where the penetration, that's from where you fly it. Try it and do it to fly on its middle, whatever, and see how it goes. There is even some of these ones we build with hand, pepper. Children build, aircraft, uh -huh. you build it to, you give it penetration so that it can, then you give it other things after that penetration so it can glide on the air. The eldership provides that gliding power. And the worst is for you to try to build large organization and now make it here. If there are 300 people, the 300 of them are, are all leaders. Everybody is leading. We are all priests. So at one time, some of them started having problems with things like tithe. They said, since we are all priests, who are we supposed to pay tithe? We can ask where. So one guy said, I pay my tithe. I collect it back with the other hand. And that's what he does. He said, Father, I bring my tithe to you. But as your priest, I collect it for you. And I eat it in Jesus' room. I'm not joking, no. No, I'm not joking. This is reality. You know, it sounds very crazy and funny, but that's actually what is going on. <laughs> and I asked them, Abraham, that is the priest of the Most High. Didn't he have a Melchizedek to pay tithe? And the, 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 the Levites, who are priests, didn't they have high priests to pay tithe? Go and study the priestly family. You will see that there is high priests. There are priests. And there are what? Levites. There are three orders. This is the order. High priest. Why? Because you need a set man. You need a set man. You need a set man. You have to have that pointed end. Then you have the priest. Then you have the Levite. These are the three orders. So watch it in the New Testament. You have the Episcopate. You have the Presbytery. You have the Diaconate. All the administrative work, all the functional work in the temple in the Old Testament are done by the Levites. All. They handle security, they handle finance, they handle everything. And that is the job of deacons. They are the ones that handle administration. The deacons, managers, if you want to use the word, managers. They manage the business side of church so that these other ones can deal with spiritual issues. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now, take note that 
for a local church. You don't have S here. You have set man. You just put one bishop over because it's actually an overseer. And you put pastors with churches. This is where you have pride. You have pastors with churches under his overseership. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now, this local church, oh, local church, I just tried to do that to help you see at the local level. You put, like, for Jerusalem, is Peter. After he moved to Rome, is James that sat over the eldership and then he ruled the church. So you don't go and gather 12 apostles and put them over one church. You don't do that. What you do is that you put apostles over different regions, but when they come together with another headship among them, they create the overall government. I think I've shown you all that yesterday. But if, if, if there's any wahala, I'll do the five levels again. Let me try it one more time. The holy order. But at least I've made one point clear before I write what I'm about to write. All these are things I've already shown you. I've made one point clear. There are three major blocks in the Holy Order. Am I correct? You have the bishops, you have the eldership as a priesthood. Then you have, the, before you get to the laity, before you get to the laity, which will say the congregation. Some people use the word members. Some say disciples, you know, or brethren. You need to be interested in this because you need to know how the kingdom you belong to is governed. You need to know how it is run. In this thing now, if you notice, there's only one thing left. So I'm going to do a second one. Second one. The five levels of the holy order. The first level, let me see if I can use blue, is the Lord, the second level is the Episcopate, the third level is the Presbytery, The fourth level the fifth level is the laity. Whether we like it or not, there is order. There is order. Some people don't like government, but there is. the bishops or the apostles. Once you get it, you have got it. The priests. 
or the elders. The administrators or the deacons the congregation or the members I don't know which word is better to use for you whether it's members or disciples or brethren, any of them have you seen what I did? These are the five levels of the Holy Order. Jesus is always recognized as the head of the church. And you know, I told you I can also expand this to seven. Remember, I showed you the three major body of leadership. If you now add the congregation, you have four. Remember, I've shown you that one already. The bishops, the priests, and that's the order. So those who are saying we need elders are correct. We need plurality of leaders backing up who the leader, the set man is. At every time you need priority, even at the admin level, you don't have one administrator over a church. You can have one head of admin, but you must have a team of leaders. That is the blueprint for New Testament church. No, you don't have one deacon. The truth is that the limit of the number for deacons is 120. This is the numbers for this. This is the numbering values for this. This is usually one. This is 12. So between 3 and 12. This is uh, 70. This is 120. This is now from 500 to any point. Everywhere you look in the Bible, you will see what I'm telling you. You must have a leader. After that, if he is the kings, the kings, this is what you have. Let me try. This is the priesthood. The priesthood. It's after this, now you have number four, which is congregation. This Old Testament Levitical order. Now, in the kingdom, the kingdom, whether it's under David or any king, you normally have the first thing is the first person, the king. Then you have the princes. There are always 12. Then you have the elders. Then you have the citizens. They don't use the word citizens in the Bible. They call them the children of Israel. Hmm? Usually you have one here. You have 12 here. You have 70 elders here and you can have any number here normally you have one here you have 12 here it can also be more you have 70 and you have any number it can also be more Moses and the 70 elders of Israel every time 70 70 elders but if you look, you, they will tell you that they have 12 princes because there are 12 tribes. They have 12 princes leading those tribes. You remember that? Like when they need to send spies, how many did they send? But do you know there were elders present at that time and there are 17 in number? That's why after Jesus Christ picked 12 to be his apostles, the Bible said he ordained 70 orders. He's following that blueprint. And by the time you go to the day of Pentecost, there were 120. 
And the scripture said when he rose from the dead, he also appeared to 500. It seems that all his three and a half years of ministry, that the number of disciples he left behind were 500. Now, we are not dealing with multitudes. If you, you know, multitude, uh, you know. Now, look at what is left. I didn't give you anything on the other side. It's the Lord. That Jesus Christ, our Lord, heading the church. Here is the principle of church government you must all understand. It's called the principle of apostolic succession. That Jesus Christ, yes, is the head of the church, but since he arose from he- to heaven, he handed his authority to man. That's why you have the concept of the set man. In the Coptic church, is a pope. In the Catholic church, is a pope. In in the Anglican church is the archbishop. In the Methodist church is the primate. In Dominion City, we use the primate. In Winner's Chapel is archbishop. You know, they still call Bishop Oyerepo bishop. That year, he started ordaining bishops, Bishop Abioye, Bishop Ajema, and all those bishops. If you go to their document now, you see that his title is Archbishop. In Church of God Mission, is Archbishop. That's why Mama Idaosa now is Archbishop. You know that's her. It's not just in the document. It has always been in the document. But somewhere along the line, because they have a number of bishops, she decided it's time to actually start answering it. That's what Idaosa was, Archbishop. That's the, what the Anglican Church also uses. He's headed by an archbishop in London. Already, based on the way things are going for them, they need to create a new world because they are beginning to have archbishops over certain regions. So, you know, as structure grows, eh? so the Catholic Church, when they got, started having archbishops, over whatever they had to create cardinals and then you know now it ends with the papas the pope what we're saying is that jesus will not come on earth to he heads everything and he heads the universal church but as per a local assembly he must be headed by a set man is somebody hearing what i'm saying That is how you get the structure in order. That's the five order that there is. Jesus said with his mouth that the way you treat the one that represents him is how you treat him. Anybody that is trying to see Jesus before he will, is wasting his time. That is, this thing is what is called the Episcopal style of church government. The most recent is this, is 19th century creation. It's actually people out of rebellion and reaction. They don't want to have, they came out about it and I've also seen it firsthand. I have seen the futility of it. The day you have, for example, tried it in a country where all of us are our own leader, no, no government, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. Just see how that society will look in one year. And they got one of my sisters confused because they were teaching them all these pastors, all this whatever. And she went and joined them. You know how the case I'm talking about? By the time. They, they got her pregnant. Because who, where, where would they be? And she came back, a very godly girl, and she, you know, it, it was too late. And the guy that went to lead this, whatever, was a guy that we disciplined for immorality. 
he went and got books by brethren because he didn't want anybody to tell him what to do. And they started that thing. And before we knew it, you know, that one guy has messed up close to 26 of those. Because how would there be check and balances? No, no, no more. There is nothing like leadership. He said, when you come to church service, for example, how does a church serve? He said, nobody should moderate it. Nobody should. We should just come, we join hands and pray, and let the Holy Spirit lead. And when we finish prayer, he said, who preaches? He said, anything the Holy Spirit gives you, you share. So even people that are not matured in the faith will come out and say some crazy things. Other people, when they got to the kind of crisis they got to, they knew. Most of them evaporate. They don't last, some of them don't last beyond five, seven years. Others have actually succeeded. I went to preach to one group last week in Ilupeju. Yes. I, I went to uh, preach to missionary organizations and people came. And inside that setup, there were two of those brethren. They don't believe in anything. All their books and writing is against the church. They call Pentecostals Babylon. They call uh, Khan Babylon, PFM Babylon. Of course, they were even telling me openly there that uh, there is no hope for all those issues. So all these attempts we are doing to, you know, and that any pastor, any church that has pastoral pastors and leaders are Babylon. So any church that has church name is Babylon. That you shouldn't have name. You should just say the church in Lagos. The church in Abuja. And that all of us should just answer the brethren. Eh? But this is where... Now, let me read something for you. Let me read. In the Episcopal system, the chief ministers of the church are bishops, you know, headed by a point man. The basic principle behind this type of government is apostolic succession, that the authority of Jesus was passed to the apostles, which they passed to other people as time went on till we got here. Um, an example is the functions of Timothy and Titus. As revealed in the pastoral epistles, these men have apostolic or bishop uh, position and authority. It's their job now to go and ordain elders in every church. Look at Acts 14, verse 23, an example. Did you see that? These people are ordaining pastors. This I have told you yesterday, elders are pastors over here. Now, who are ordaining them? Paul and Barnabas were the ones doing this. After they were commissioned, they were the ones. Now, later, when Paul was leaving for Rome and whatever, he wrote to Timothy and Titus and charged them they should travel around every city and do the same thing for the churches. Did you notice everywhere you see this word, these elders are in plural. Am I correct? Then you have the chief elder. That is the man that is in charge of the church. The chief presbyter. That's the, the, for the local assembly, that's the pastor of the church. Let me give you an example. Titus. I think it's Titus. Is it Titus chapter 3? Find it for me, Pastor. Jesus. Titus chapter 3. You see where Paul was also writing to that one. To go and ordain elders. Is it chapter 3 or chapter 4? Chapter 3 or chapter 2? Oh, 
Okay, chapter 1, sir. Huh? Chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause I left thee in Crete. This is Greece now, you know, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed them. You see, they are supposed to transfer that authority to another person when they had to leave, to another set man who continues the same principle. And when that set man is in, for example, when uh, uh, Pastor Adebwe is through, he has to also transfer that authority that the founder transferred to him to another set man. And that is how it continues. It's not congregation that sit down and elect. You will never find it in the Bible. Where Moses finished he has to call children of Israel to come. It's time for voting. Election time has come. Uh, we need to elect the new Moses because the time for the Son of Man to go has come. And then they will vote, you know, whoever wins. You know, if you go to Assembly of God and see voting time, Assemblies of God, if you see the kind of politics, you see that pastors also give bribe. You see how they will visit him from house to house, you know, negotiating for who will vote for them because you have to be geo for the next four years. It's like, you know, then you see elders, they serve two, two years, one, one, three years, when it's time to renew because you have opportunity of two times. They will be going, conversing, politicking. That's what gave rise to church politics. The Catholic Church even has um, a better system. And their system is that if the set man dies and there is nothing left behind, a, a direction on what happens to the church, you have a college of bishops or college of cardinals. They will come together and declare a few days of fast and before whatever, whether it's 72 hours as maximum they gave them, you know, they come out of that retreat with a new... So you don't, it's not call congregation to start voting who pastors are. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Mm. Somebody asked me once when I was teaching, he said, what if something happens to you? You don't know. I said, I've left some instructions for her. You will call the CEC and give them those instructions. Simple. So there is no confusion here. Okay. Um, ask me questions so I can tell you what is on my heart this afternoon because this is just a recap. But you know there are three types of church administration that exist in the body of Christ today. There are other variations of this so that sometimes you now see. I don't want to bother myself about it. For example, Catholic Church uses Episcopal. Or of course, all the churches that started from Peter to now uses it because you can see Jesus did not leave the church in the hands of it. He appointed Peter who led the twelve and from there they led you know, a team of... So that has been the principle. Now, one of the things you see here is that from the time of the early church, the Episcopal form has been the pattern. During the time of the Reformation, which is 1500, I want you to take note. It's the reason why I'm telling you all this. So that you know, during the time of the Reformation, which is the 1500, um, people like Martin Luther and Co. preach the priesthood of all believers. Hmm? But finally, when the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church, and the Evangelical Churches came out, they needed to have government. So they finally went back to Episcopal. I hope you are listening to what I'm saying. That's what the Anglican Church has. That's what all those churches have. You have to have the key man. You have to have the bishops. Then you have the others continue. 
down. The only thing is that they didn't structure to poop. But they always have a different name for that chemo, whether it's primate or bishop or whatever. You are getting it. Now, but as we went down the line, the Presbyterians came and they felt that the plurality of leadership is what they needed to have and they created the presbytery type. Now, take note, the Episcopal started from Pentecost and has been there till now. The Presbyterian came after the Reformation, which is 1500. The Congregational is 19th century and 20th century. It is the one that is very, very far from the Scripture. Now, in appointing administrators, functionaries, and all that, we can ask the brethren and give them criteria for doing that to appoint such people. Why the leadership of the church approved? That doesn't mean that the congregation is now the ones running church government. Even in democratic setting where we allow the people to vote their leader, it doesn't mean it's the people that are running the government. Or are they? So it's a complete... And a number of them are now looking for a way to... So some are, are creating um, a, an elder. They, some created a form of government they call a single elder, whatever, so that they can give one man whatever to run. But they said he's accountable to the congregation, whichever way. But these are the things, and I believe you've got it. Dominion City operates an Episcopal system. We operate a pastoral form of church government. Where... The order, like I've set it down for you here, the structure. Uh, where the structure comes from Jesus down to leadership, down to until he gets down to the congregation. You can see from the set man to, you know, the Apostolic Council to the Elders Council or the Pastoral Council down to the Board of Deacons and down to the congregation. That's the le levels of authority that you have here. That is the Dominion City structure. The set man, or what some people call General Overseer, the Apostolic Council or what some people call board of trustees. If you, when you talk about registration with government, you use that word, or whatever, or part C, part of our constitution, um, down to the pastoral council, down to the deacons council, or the council of deacons, or board of deacons, down to the congregation. I think, you know, the thing should be clear enough for everybody. That our pastoral council, we also use a word, the general executive council. It's a, a council of pastors and ministers that are ordained into ministry here. And, um, you know, we sometimes call our Apostolic Council, the Central Executive Council. I've actually set a date, 2015 uh, uh, maximum. I said from 2012, I will look if they've met some standards, because most of the standards I've given to the guys that are there, like having a set of churches they've planted, because a bishop is not just pastoring a local church, he's overseeing a set of churches. And um, I gave all that uh, conditions that are not even in the Bible, but we have created it for our first set of guys, you know, growing their church beyond the 5,000 mark. I'm actually giving them 10,000 mark, you know, and plus the number of churches, the pastors overseeing churches, and so on and so forth. And we're going to ordain bishops. Yes, we're going to do that. You know, uh, so if you hear that we are having an ordination service next year, 
to them bishops. Don't let that bother you. Mm. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Watch this. First Timothy. Chapter 3, from verse 1, put, just put verse 1. It's true saying, if a man desired the office of a bishop, he desired what? Okay, verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality up to teach not giving to wine not striker not greedy or filthy looker but patient not a brother not covetous go on one that rulate well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity go on for if a man knowing not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of god now starting with the leader of the church himself. He was 30 years when he, he pioneered this whole thing we are all talking about. And most of those people, he gathered around him. I heard that one or two of them were older than he, like Peter. You know? Now, when he got to Paul, he was a young man, Saul of Tarsus, when he was pioneering and going around killing Christians. And then he got caught and he went into ministry, ending of an apostle. But I'll tell you something. The the, those young guys that he made bishop like Bishop Timothy, Bishop uh, Titus, there were other ones, if you have read the church history, you know, um, were all young men. But what happened is that the Catholic Church progressed and a lot of priests and pastors were coming. Somewhere along the line, they wanted people who have also stayed in the faith, pastored for years, proving themselves over some time. So, we started putting at least people who were a little more elderly, you know. Um, when some of my friends who were, who were in school doing ministry and then left school pioneering churches, and two of them, when they decided to be ordained as bishops, I remember one time I invited one of them and um, to preach with me in Enugu and uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm not a bishop. I'm not. And I said, don't you feel very funny? And we're all laughing about it. Like uh, Dr. Hussein, last year, Pastor Steve stood. Uh, I was supposed to be there to stand with him, but of course I wasn't. I was in the International Council of Bishops <coughs> ordained him a bishop. And um, because he has planted 70, uh, 70 churches, you know. So, and when we met you, I said, I, I, are, you, are you feeling funny? You know, he said, no, I'm just myself, you know. But that particular one I was talking about, um, Fredado, you know, he said to me he, 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 that he's just busy doing the apostolic work he was given. And the title, irrespective, it's like husband. After you become a husband, maybe you are married. You, you, some people feel somehow. Some people want to change how they work or how they whatever. I think it's just the respect that marriage deserves that you should exhibit. Nothing else. And do your job of being a husband and a father and all that. Or we, maybe we need to ask this of you, our mother. How do you, is there a special way you carry yourself now? Having a position of a mother than the former Uju. You're even a father now. How does fatherhood feel? 
Because some people, once they get that title on their head, it moves into their head. You know, like entertainers who call themselves celebrities. You have to change how you walk. Because Fredado, you know, the other one, when you now greet him, you know, just my normal He said, oh, the Lord bless you. He will. There's even nothing like that. I do it. It depends on who. Depends on who. I like the ecclesiastical order. It's God that set it. It depends on who. Some years ago, I was passing through a toll gate and we had security men there. And at that time, they stopped me and the Catholic priest, which is, you know, and he just did them the sign of the cross and they cleared for him and they passed. And they told me, pack there. <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. He said, bring out your ID card. I brought and gave them. He looked at me. He said, you are too young to... I kept quiet. The guy that he passed, I was even older than him. He just cast off that I gave him whatever. So when I saw that, uh, next ordination service, that's when we were ordaining Pastor Michael, we ordered all the ecclesiastic I'm warning you now because the day the ordination is coming in Lagos this year, you will see how we will come at that day. For those of you who are not used to that, you will think you are yeah, in the Church of England or somewhere. Even the order of service, there is order of procession, how we enter and all of that. So we, we brought in the full power of the priesthood to bear. And um, in those days now, when I want to travel, I wear my distin with color. You know, I have different types. And then when I get to there, I, I give them the sign of the cross. And you, you just, you know. So all of them have their place, you know. And all of them have their place. Um, all of them have their place. Okay, this is the main thing I want to share with you. And um, if I do that, it will be the third element. Because I've touched church covenant. I've touched um, um, eh? I've touched God's value system. I've also touched the divine order. I've touched it. In the home, you can look at it fast. First Corinthians chapter 11, look at it fast. So that any time you're making comparison, always remember that. The divine order is in every setting here. Applied. You can take it and link it to the home. You can take it and link it to the church. Once you establish God's order of government, you now know which one is the institution you want to link up. You link up. It's usually this. The starting of the divine order is God comes, then Christ. After that, you have the man. So, whatever heads is the head of that institution you are dealing with comes immediately after Christ. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Let me put it in another way. The head. Of the institution. What I'm dealing with here is called the divine order. This is the divine order. So, if it is a nation, you know that what will be here is the, if it's a nation that has king, it will be king. If it's president, it will be president. If it is a church, it will be the set man. There has to be one person that expresses the authority of Christ. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now, when it is the family, that man there is who? The husband. Okay, well, maybe we should read that first so that I can get out. I will have you to know that the head of every man is what? Christ. And the head of the woman is what? So for the family, the next thing you are going to have here 
is the woman. And of course, the last is the children. So these are the five levels of the divine order. Um, Okay, no, put the scripture, put the scripture. I will have you to know. Everyone say head. head. Everyone say order. order. Say government. government. Say structure. structure. Because some, of, some people will read this and are talking about head tie. This thing has nothing to do with whatever you are wearing or covering. This is talking about government. Hmm? That's why it is head, not hair. Did you see that? Yes, sir. Eh? Yes, sir. His head, not hair. Not the hair of the man is Christ. <laughs> then the hair of the woman is the man. Then the day you bab your hair, you, you have finished your you have finished your husband. No, the head. The leadership. Now, the leadership over every man is Christ. The leadership over the woman is who? The man. And which man? The husband. That's why he said the man. There is only one man. The one she chooses to marry and submit to, enters into the is that. And then the head of Christ is who? So is Jesus the final authority? Eh? I know the Trinity that are equal. I was explaining this yesterday. But the equality is the same equality I have with my son. We are all human beings. All human beings are equal. <laughs> but in function, in functional, in authority, in order, they are not. Tomorrow, go and slap a policeman and tell him that you are all equal. You are all citizens. And you will learn that there is difference between O and O. <laughs> Jonathan is the same with every Nigerian. We are all equal. The truth is, um, as far as citizenship is concerned, we are all the same. But in terms of authority and function, if his vehicle is coming and they are blowing siren, block it. Say, I'm a, I'm a citizen. I have a quarrel right with you. And then see what those security men will do to you. So these are things that sometimes some people don't understand. They, they dismantle the whole structure. They kind of believe because they don't like authority. They don't want anybody to tell them. And that's the spirit, the attitude that drives Satan and everything he does. He wants to dismantle it. But after he created his own kingdom, he has structured it. You can see. Because all the demons cannot be talking at the same level. They have, they have hierarchies there. Okay, verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored his head. Who is this head he is dishonoring? It's a mystery that Christ should not be covered. Eh? It's a mystery. It's a mystery. The other one is the cross should never be covered. It's actually an offense. There are seven things that kill people in ministry. One of them is obscuring. You see that veil Moses was putting on, he says, you do it to the cross. People can't see Jesus. They see only you. You're looking for trouble. You're committing a big offense. And there are pastors that do it because of their, you know, I want to, uh -huh. at the end of the day, we don't even know that there is the Savior that died and did all that. So, and he's completely obscured. But anyway, verse 5. Every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonored her head. It is even 
all the same as if she were divorced, as if she is not married. You see, if we talk within the context of family, there are some things I can say <laughs> and do and get away with it. She cannot try it because there is an authority over her. Watch. In the context of dominosity, there are some things I can say and do and get away with it. Pastor Dubus cannot try it. He has an authority. Even in the Catholic Church, some things those priests you see there cannot try. A power higher than them will come after them. You don't dishonor your covering. You don't dishonor your covering. But I also want to say that even that higher person, there are some things he cannot say or do in relation with Christ and get away with it. Something will happen not long after. <laughs> Look at a simple example of, of, of covering the spiritual force that set us in the place. Moses was told to speak to the rock. And that rock is Christ. We're talking about this covering of he was told to speak to the rock. But that day he was really angry. So he said, We will give you water, ye rebels, and struck the rock. And that day God said, Your ministry is over. You are going to die on top of this mount, Nebo. He said, um, because you did not sanctify me before the people. You forgot that you are a representative leader. You are, you are an under-shepherd under me. You may have those elders under you, but you are under. You, you did not sanctify me before your people. It's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. And he pleaded and pleaded, and God said, don't speak to me about it. And it was one thing God did not forgive him about. He died without seeing the land that he labored for 80 years to help the people come to. 40 years. The way the kingdom works that every leader must always point to the authority that is under. It's just that simple. You submit to that reverence and then things will just flow well. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's why Let me leave you for now and leave you with less confusion. But I've already pointed it out yesterday that there is ministry admin and there is local church admin. And that ministry admin exercises authority next to the set man, even over the pastors. Why local church admin? Because somewhere along the line, you're going to meet what I'm... Uh, <laughs> we are going to meet what I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with. Eh? Where certain things we need to be passed on to local chapters in different places. You will run into a structural reporting line now. You see where you have some challenges in it. So, but right now, Focus on developing something that is deployable within a local congregation and it delivers. Then we will now help you come back to do, see how you link it up. You might already know how to do it because you have banks with branches everywhere. So it's just that basic principle. You know, you know how to deploy what works in a particular chapter of a bank. You don't know how the whole thing is linked up. That's why after a while you start hearing of things like managing directors, group managing directors, those things are designed for effective deployment of structure and authority. 
Okay. If a woman disgraces her husband and dishonors her husband, she's like somebody whose husband is dead. Shaving is just a symbol that you don't have any more coverage. The hair is just giving us a symbol of covering. You know, what we are discussing is not hair, it's authority. So shaving is also a symbol of there is no authority over, my, over me. Because a widow and a single woman is not under this structure. That you, they are all treated. <laughs> the, a widow, for example, is directly under her, her father. I mean, a single woman is directly under her father. Just like this man is not husband, he's her father. Um, a widow is actually almost like every other man. It's true. Only she chooses to marry again. What it simply means is that Christ is the head of everybody in the church. Is he not? Hmm? Male and female. But when a woman takes a marriage vow, she also has under the government of Christ, um, Lord Temporal, they call it. You have Lord Eternal or Lord Supreme. Then you, he has already created one, Temporal. Okay. I actually said somebody should ask me a question, uh, but I have not seen any. So I'm going to assume that everything is understood. Now, I now need to give you the most critical thing. It will get your admin ministry is the philosophy of the administration the, that will govern the admin administrators. The philosophy of admin ministry. Because it's a ministry that you are doing. It's a ministry. Shall I try? Shall I try? Okay, let me try. In case somebody asks you any day, where are you in the Bible? You know, you know the fivefold ministry. You know where it is in the Bible. Put it up. Four eleven Ephesians. You know that. When you talk the five purposes of the church and you are looking for, you can go there and see them. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. You know, a five of them. Five of them. Teachers handle discipleship. Pastors handle fellowship. That is church development. It's called consolidation. Prophets handle prayers. Evangelists handle mission. Apostles handle ministry development. And the whole thing about structure. Should I say it again? The five purposes of the church. You, you, you know there are five. The first is prayer, is it not? Is prophetic ministry. The second is mission, is evangelist. The third is fellowship. That is developing congregations, developing both small groups and congregations, is pastoral ministry. The fourth is discipleship, is the ministry of teachers. The fifth is ministry. Is the apostolic ministry. Okay. Now, there are five purposes of the church revealed in the Great Commission. So that gone. At least not, you know, my worry today. Then there are seven supportive ministries. in the church. Hmm? We who are in the transformational agenda have been able to define them to be number one, family. Number two, education. 
Number three, business. Number four, government. Number five, social services. Number six, media. Number seven, entertainment. It's because I'm inside church setting that I listed it like that. Normally when I'm not in a church environment, the first one is usually religion. Religion. Yes, religion. It's usually religion. Should I leave you to write it that way? Maybe it's better. Eh? Eh? So you can have it too. Okay, make the first religion. Make the second education. You already have a third is, is um, business. Fourth is government. Then make the fifth social services in bracket right family. You can actually write family over that. And you, you get it. Then you have the sixth as media and the seventh as entertainment. You've got that. You've got that. Yes. Huh? If you want to ask me a question, ask. Ask it up. Government is number four there. Another question. Yes. You can use any of the two. You can use the word family there. What we do, see the issue. I want you to know that. Whenever we leave church setting and we want to deal with the secular world, we replace religion with social services. We always replace it with social services. Or what do I mean? When I'm dealing within church setting, which already has the church arm, you know you have five purposes of the church dealing with religion and its five branches. You understand what I'm saying? So whenever we are within a church setting where you already have a full-blown, what is called cooperation, dealing with this, instead of now bringing it out again, you know, we replace it with social services. So that you can have prison, you know, the sick, health, all kinds of, you know, uh, widows, well, all those things. That's practical religion. Religion is practical. Faith in action, that's what we we'll call it. It's called social services. No, call number five, family. It will help you to think in line with the way I'm talking. Yes, write it like that. So I said any time, you know, because is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Okay. So Romans chapter 12, look at that. There are also seven listed here. This is the way the, the knowledge has grown to you today. But there's also seven. They are called supportive ministries. I want to submit to you that um, the whole body of admin must at least cover these seven elements. Let me sit down while I, I list them for you. I want to say that the whole body of admin must at least cover these seven elements. It's not limited to it. There are other things. But at least these seven is a ministry. Okay. Um, let me put it another way. The whole supportive ministry should cover at least these seven areas. We are, we, 
for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. Go on. So we, be many, are one body in Christ and every one member. <coughs> Excuse me. Every, every one member, one of another. Continue. Continue. Then we have gifts, different gifts according to the grace that is given to us. Now the first is called prophecy. The second is gone. Ministry. <laughs> you see them use that word. I'm talking about helps, service. Okay, the third is teaching. The fourth is exhortation. You can also put their motivation. The fifth is giving. You can put their finance. The sixth is government. You can also put beside it administration. The seventh is mercy. You can put beside it charity. What, what are some of the words we use for it inside? Welfare. Uh -huh. Let love be without dissimulation. That's, we don't want it fake. Avoid what is evil, cleave to that which is good. Verse, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Okay. Now, go back to the beginning of that. I think it's verse 6 or... That first one you call prophecy is called preaching. Be going. The next one is uh, ministry, serving or helps. The other one is teaching. If you don't use education, education, training, all of that. The next one is uh, exhortation. We have also talked about motivation. Motivation. Then we have administration, management, all of that. And then we have charity. <laughs> I told you, let me repeat, that the, the Dickness office can go from, you know, up to 120. I told you that. And there are still many other things. But they, the early church, started with seven decades. But there are many other things. Today, you talk about IT, you talk about properties, you talk about facility management, you talk about programs, you talk about all kinds of things. They didn't have TV, they didn't have media, they didn't have radio, they didn't have all of those things at that time. But they were able to create supportive ministries to be able to back them up with what was available at that time. Starting with finance, starting with things like charity, starting with a number of the other things. Hmm? Okay. We too can tomorrow include estates, even business, church businesses, um, Peter and Co. did not envisage us owning your own printing press. They didn't envisage us building estates. Anyway, by the time he got to Rome, I'm, I'm sure he did that. But at least when at that time when they were taking off, you know, as they went on, all of those things came on further. Mm. I want to question. And of course, you know, in First Corinthians chapter. 12 verse 7, you have the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. That one, 
you know, flows through both the congregation and every levels of ministry and all of that. Yes, yes. The seven I mentioned before, spheres of society. Um, the truth is that all of them can match. For example, if you want me to match it for you, I can match it for you. But um, I will give you two suggestions as per how you can develop the structure so that you don't have problem. Hmm? Watch what I'm going to do and document it. Find what will work for you. If you do the block of pastoral leadership here, you can, once to do your organogram, you can do something like this. Now, you can do something like this. I have three major arms of government, of uh, ministry in your structure. Here you have core operations. Here you have support operations. <laughs> Here you have find what you will call it, you know. Maybe social arm operations. Uh, should I call it social or societal? So here. You have prayer, you have mission, you have fellowship, you have discipleship. Remember that the main thing that brought me here, I've not done it all. Why here you have um, religion, you have education, you have education, you have business. You have government, you have media, and you have arts and culture. That's you have entertainment. You have, what is it? Religion, family. Religion, family, education. Hmm? Then here, you can have finance, you have admin, have programs, have um, ICT have technical, have 
project. <laughs> now, I, I just listed the things you are doing. You are getting yourself a You can list the seven major ones there. Now, let me give you what this will mean. That, I don't know how you are classifying. You know, you can, in a, a ministry like this, because we're, it's a spiritual organization, a faith-based, cooperation will be the five purpose of the church. Next to that will be the seven spheres of influence. Then finally, the support ministries will now be all those other ones that back them up. Let, if you want me to do the conversion for you, I can do it fast. Project them back. Uh, uh, project it back. Already you have prophecy, which is religion. You have teaching, which is education. Um, you have charity, which is social service or family. You have uh, ruling, which is government. You have giving, which is business or economic, whatever. You have motivation, which is media, is communication. And then you have one more thing there. Ministry, Ministry which is arts. Yes. You know, we are using it just for, to crack jokes. It's actually a ministry. It's actually a ministry. I had a, a friend of mine who said that ministry part should be given to family. He believed that it should go to family and all of that, but, you know. Now, what I'm trying to point out finally is that uh, when we're developing the seven spheres of society, it wasn't like this is where we, we developed it from. It has its own scriptural foundation. I will possibly, another time if we are dealing with that, we'll go and look at it. It has its own spiritual foundation. But people have tried to probe into the mind of the apostles, especially someone like Paul. And... Uh, the way they classified society at their time and how he's doing this classification. But we know that civilization has grown well. There is no way. If you want to look at society, it's way it's structured. You have to look at it from these seven arms. You know? Now, uh, we also know we have 12 sphere. You can even expand it further. Mm -hmm. Okay. What question I would like you to ask is, when you list these seven things, you need to start asking yourself, do you have a welfare program to take care of mercy? Do you have a financing system? Do you have administrative system to take care of government and management and all that? Do you have you know, a, a training system to take care of education within the church. People know there are levels of development. Sure, I've listed those seven things. Uh -huh. Do you have it? You know, um, um, Is this thing clear? Or which structure? The other structure I wanted to put up for you there is where you just do it. One pastor, just do cooperation here, support operation here. You understand? Now the reason is this. I have seen the ministry that begins another structure from here and put the seven spheres here. It depends. You know, you know this issue of structure. 
you can keep dragging it down and having many columns, or you can spread it further. It depends on what you think is. Um, you can write there now, put it now, and start so that the ministry department focuses on all those things. But we have also seen a structure that does not put it that way. Sometimes it's more effective that puts it. So it can have its own. This is societal transformation. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This is impacting society. It has its own. And you list those seven. So you can have somebody in charge of it. Why this thing you call ministry is where you put some other ministries like you know you are having authentic manhood, you are having uh, youth, a national youth project, you are having the new eve, you are having the children church, you are having the teens church, there are even five basics, then you can now the day you can extend to prison ministry to do, so that your support operations can be those things that are uh, to a large extent technical in nature that support the real ministry work from going on. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? That's why um, if you look at the ones I listed, I did not add anything that has ministry direct in it. Admin, equipment, ICT, all those things. I didn't. Because under ministry, you can start listing men ministry, women ministry, children's ministry, um, teens ministry, you can say prison ministry, welfare ministry, and every other ministry you like to put there. So do you know what some people do? They carry these seven things and, and list them under that ministry and just keep developing further and leave support operations to mean the those technical things i think it will be better for you if you follow that kind of you know but you that's why you are consultants you you can deal with it you you know at the end of the day we want to see what you came out with finally in structure because structure is a vehicle i've told you that is to carry the vision to its destination so design what you believe that, but design in such a way that it can have easy penetration. It is not cumbersome that is the medium of oppression, which is our society, is resisting it. You are trying to get it to move. It can't travel fast because it's having a lot of resistance. So you structure it in such a way that it can get the job done fast. Things, once we say we want to do something, it flows down fast, you know, and things are getting done fast. Once you are looked at that. I think you, you've done the right thing. You know. Did I create more confusion for you? Yes. Or make it easier? Okay. Okay. Your chingon has finished. Come and get a new one. I'm not joking. This one is sweeter than that one. It's, it's softer. You see the kind of thing she's doing. But she is addressing the church. But I'm telling you that you are on inside the church. You have organs, so you have there is episcopate. That body needs a set of policies and systems that manage that operates there. You have the pastoral. That is also a body. It's a governing body in the church. Then you will have the diaconess. That's where you belong. You need to develop. I'll just mention a few basic ones. You need to develop your vision. Your mission. And your values. You even need to finally come to things like your own structure. And policies.
Let me kind of touch only two and leave you with your burden. Structure, it's not my business. If you can't develop your structure, how can you develop for the church? Because I have already shown you that uh, this I admit is not a one man thing. You have a, a colossus. So when you finish structuring, you show how the reporting, reporting line. So that when there are problems, you can also correct. Because the institution that changes other institutions gets itself. Just like when you get the church right, the church changes Nigeria. When you get Dominion City right, Dominion City will influence many of, the, of other churches in this country. And we end up changing Nigeria. When you get your admin system right, you will change this ministry. You will. Are you understanding what I'm saying? <laughs> the culture of the admin ministry. You know, I said the philosophy and the structure. You know, the, the philosophy is the first. The philosophy of this ministry. Because it's a ministry. The philosophy that we have covered the structure will be the second part. What kind of structure will help you get your job done? Then you have the policies or the the yeah the policy document. I'm just going to contribute two things here and leave you alone. <laughs> you you see. If your eyes are not bright enough, I will do it again. I will do it again till I'm sure you get it. You are building an organization that will serve an organization. That's what we are doing. Have you heard of oil servicing companies? Huh? Eh? Is his own organization that services other organizations. And if you get this organization right, you will soon start servicing more than Dominion City because you can do church consulting. It's a big business. This your organization needs to be gotten right. Why your eyes on us, the church? <laughs> uh, you need to define the vision. Is it to make Dominion City a world class, you know, run uh, institution? Is it to make Dominion City an excellently managed organization? Is it to, and you will find a way to say it. Whether it's doing kingdom work with excellence. Or is it that whatever? You need to have a way of explaining how you go about accomplishing that vision. For us in the ministry, we said that what we are trying to do, that this raising leaders to transform society, that we are trying to achieve it by helping everyone discover their purpose, you know, develop their potentials, and deploy them towards national transformation. We, we said that the way we are trying to get it accomplished is through the deployment of the five purposes of the church and the seven spheres of society. Basically that. To deploy ministry towards those five directions of the church and the seven reasons. That is it. That's the way we, we try to define our mission. If you find better ways of helping us define it, beautiful. So we need to, because this is what will give you that selling thing. 
do you know that uh, a time is coming when you are going to be deploying technicians or consultants to chapters to go and help them put their house in order? A man that runs this kind of whatever, he started with his church after they've done it so well with his church, the senior pastor commissioned him to set it up as a consulting firm in the U.S. His own is that he said he wants every church to have a solid foundation that can withstand any storm, any rain that can come in the future. Even if that means sudden death of the founder, that there will be no confusion. Because processes are put in place, succession plan are put in place. Even if it means that there is an attack from the media, there is nothing. That, that what his uh, ministry does is to give the church a very strong foundation. You know, structural foundation. We already have the spiritual, but we need to have that other one that his job is to protect the ministry of the church in defining his mission. He stated some of those things. And each time he speaks in a pastor's conference, all the pastors are charged. Everybody, they start going to pay consultation fee. Everybody wants him to. And I wished, even in the meeting, that I could drag him to Nigeria. Because he has this thing. But he's an administrator of a church. I have helped that church gain stability and growth. Is this man that wrote the five purpose of the church? His chief, yes. He's now doing it as consulting all over the US. Why the five purpose of the church itself have become a consulting pattern as being used for churches. Just this year alone, they ran training in Nigeria in four corners of the nation. They ran in like, this February, they ran in Abuja for the Northern part, they ran in Port Harcourt. Uh, I think three. And they were all running concurrently. People that have been trained in it came from America. They will drop two of them in Lagos, two of them in Abuja, and two of them in Port Harcourt, and they are run just the five purposes of the church. They have another group now that run the admin part of it. And it's a consulting ministry. They came from the U.S. And pastors pay heavily to get because they put your house in order for you. They have templates now. So define your vision, define your mission, how you want to accomplish that. Then, you are going to define your core values. Hmm. Different from just the values we have stated for Dominion City. Because you are carrying out a ministry that services the body of Christ, there are values that must not be missing among you. Let me list some of them. Number one. Let me just list seven for you. Okay. I think before I list it, it's important I show you these scriptures. Project it for them. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 19. You see people who administer things, what qualification they should have. Not Deuteronomy, Exodus. This is what Jethro told Moses. Hacking now unto my voice and I will give you counsel. God shall be with thee. Build out for the people. You know, that's what you are trying to do for us now. Build out for the people God's word. Have time to pray and seek God's face. That you may bring their causes to God. Let me tell you, yesterday when I left you, the moment I got in, my sister is at the point of death. Pastor, you need to pray. You know, I don't want my sister to die. Da, 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 and all those whatever. You know, and I didn't feel any anointing to raise anybody dying. That's what normally happens when we are running about holding land meeting, the churches, but whatever. If there is a crisis in your house, you call us to help you. The oil is not there. You have drained it out, pursuing what we shouldn't be doing. So the man that should have time to focus on prayer. Um, and, and have a revelation and be able to deal with anything that faces human beings. You say, okay, your boss now, they are trying to sack you. You want to call us to speak a word. That we are drained out. 
because we are doing what admin should be doing. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, now, that you may bring their causes to God. So anytime they have anything that you need to bring, you can get that thing. Look at the next thing that you free us to do. Now, you are going to see the core values that will drive you because you must enable us to do this. Look at verse 20. And you teach them ordinances and laws. This is where to have revelation knowledge, principles to teach the church. By the time he's finished running, he's doing land, he's doing this, he finishes Sunday, nothing is coming out. You see what I'm doing for you now? That is actually my rightful position. This is what I'm supposed to do. Teach them God's laws, his ordinances, so they don't violate that. Number three, show them the way they must walk. You show divine pattern. You don't just come, say, because the people say they are doing that, you leave them, they will create more problems and cause confusion. You have to show them the divine pattern that they must follow. The lay down procedure. Because it's not your job to invent them. They are there already. The last thing is show them the work they must do. Did you see that? Then he said, these are the criteria of the people. These are the criteria. List it. The next verse. Moreover, you shall provide out of the people. Now, there are four criteria listed here. The first is a woman. I think I need to write to, so that from there you can see what I'm saying. Okay, let me try and see if I can do it here. One, a woman. You know what that means? Competence. Yes. Um, the second is men that fear God. The third is men of truth. The fourth is and people that hate covetousness, they who hate greed. Let's just look at this for now. So you will see. Everybody you are dragging is not qualified to come and do this thing you are trying to. This is a spiritual environment. Watch. First is that they must have competence. That's why someone like Phoebe is very useful. Someone like uh, uh, happiness is very. Because of this is what they are also doing in the industries. Look at Men that hate truth is men, men of truth is integrity. Hating covetousness, this is actually people who have not only probity, they have a sense of accountability. But basically, these are people that have financial integrity. These are people that are trustworthy. Trustworthy. People you can trust. Trustworthy. 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 The men that fear God is men that have, that have reverence. For the things of God. If somebody can come and talk about spiritual authority anyhow and whatever, you are dragging him into administration. You keep him away from here. As you go, you watch people who don't have value and fear for the things of God. Keep them away from here. Keep them away from here. Just because whatever this house of god so you have to know now you see what if you list listen to the four things you say leadership should do eh? i'm now showing you what management if you listen to those four things and that mean is the helpmate to leadership listen to those four things the man must have time to focus on prayer and god to bring the causes of the people to god he must receive word and that he must teach them god's laws and ordinances 
it must show the people the way they must walk. And it must show them the work they must do. Because it's the people that actually do the real work. Leadership is to equip them to do the work of the ministry. That's what I'm trying to do to you now. Now, if you look at this thing, you see that competence is not enough. Just because everybody competent person because it's in the church, who leave them at the function level. You need people to do your at admin level, which is management level, to run things. <laughs> Character, co- competence, and credibility must match. Competence must match with character. You can see integrity. They have to be men of truth. They have to be men of truth. That's why when you ignore those things, you start having issues, deacons that are stealing church money, they arrest where a deacon, each time that is service, because he's, he, he will attend meeting, he knows the type of color, because they knew that people were stealing offering. Offering time, people will bring out their own whatever and be collecting offering in church. So, but this, he didn't know that he was one of them that was doing that. So they will go. They will say today, this Sunday, you are using blue. He is in the meeting. He's even one of those collecting. He will go and bring out his children. He has grown up children and buy blues for them. And sometimes they bring their friends. They will go in the congregation. And after they go and load their the car and drive off to the house. Then they will come and discuss. We are still having problems. They will talk about cameras and all that. He knows where everything is. He will go and change his own strategy. Until one day, <laughs> you know, like they say, well, every day is for the team, one day is for the owner of the house. So they, they decided to do some of that thing without involving the Dickens. The Pastor Chris came and had all the report, and they decided, and they brought some other type of camera that you wouldn't even know that they are in existence. Some look like Bob, some even have whatever, and put them in different places. And left the original one, which he has already known how to avoid. Or how to sometimes switch off. And the camera recorded how Oga was directing his children and how to the point of watching them when they loaded the car, they picked the car number and they drove off with the money. They even captured them where in a toilet where they were selecting out hard currencies from different bags and putting them and took off. Hmm? So the next time they called for me, he came again. And they said, we think that this job is in Tana. And he was suggesting, talking, you know, we think that somebody here is. Do you think you have any idea? He said, ah, pastor, how can you be asking me that kind of question? I have served this church for whatever. Are you saying that I probably know the person? Or are you even referring to me? That would be like... How can you ever insinuate this kind of thing? The guy asks the IT guy, project this before everybody. And uh, he fell on the ground and started crying. Is the devil, is all that, is all that. But of course, before he did that, he has invited the police. And he not only brought in the police, they asked the police, he said, since the word of God could not change them. But now, you know, and we know, they say, among every 12, there might be one Judas. But admin now puts a system to catch the Judas or to make sure that he's not able to function. Because if you think that things are not leaking away in your system, you might be joking. You might be joking. Who are the people who collect your offering? Also? He said, ushers. Who are those ushers? Who gave ushers right? There has to be admin people everywhere. Monitor and then direct that thing to where it should be. And you get all those men out of that place. Who are those ushers? People are feeding on your offerings on Sunday after Sunday. Say you are doing stupid admin. You need to know the world we are in now. You see? He's good in IT. Doesn't mean anything. He's into consulting, whatever. Doesn't mean anything. Does he have the fear of God? 
Does he have character to back up that competence? Does he have hatred for fear for covenant? Check a person that is already in his dealings with his brothers and sisters in the church and all that. You know, it's like the case we are dealing with. Uh, uh, the other place where he came from, he has fought and uh, gone to police, whatever, over 20,000. People will say he is what if you carry him and put over, over money or over people. It's like her. Her own might not be uh, integrity of uh, financial issues, stealing your money, but she has serious character problems. She needs to grow into it. She wants to come and sit over people. Sit over who? Church of Jesus Christ is not a playground. Let me actually show you something. Uh, is Timothy. Timothy. First Timothy chapter 3. Verse 8. There are seven qualifications listed for the deacon there. You know, I don't really have the, the patience to list them for you now. Okay, I will list them for you. I won't write it. What, that's what I mean. I don't have the whatever to go and start writing. Or should I write? I should write them. Eh? Okay, I can mention them. First Timothy 3. Likewise, the deacon must be grave. Grave. What does that mean? Hmm? Serious. I like that, whatever. But use the word sober. Okay, use the word sober stroke serious. That's serious-minded person. Number two. eh? Serious-minded. That's the way you say it so it can make sense. Sober. Sober Sober-minded. Number two. He must not be double-tongued. Did you see that? He's a person that if he tells you something, he's that. Number three. He must not be given to much wine. Substance abuse. Today, it includes drugs or, and other types of substances. But then it's alcohol that they use in their own time. Number four, you see the same thing Moses listed, uh, uh, hating covetous. He must not be greedy for filthy lucre. Do you know what is lucre? Gain. Lucre is gain. I made it. Breakthrough. But why did God call it filthy lucre? Because that is an unjustified. He either got the money through cheating or he got. Now, once the person can do it in the place of his work, he will do it in church. Once he can do it in a place or in business, he can do it in church. What God is looking for is that we should check out their character first. Where this people are reliable individual when it comes to this financial issue. Check his dealings with people. Check his aspect of double tongue. Is he a person? You say one thing, tomorrow he will change the thing in the middle of the game. You know you are not dealing with a reliable human being. Go and carry him and put over, over God's house. How many have I mentioned? Four. So you see that financial integrity coming up again. Number five. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. You see why this issue about he must be not only have convictions, he must have you know, we're a disciple person. This person must be a disciple. And he's somebody that has the fear of God too. He must have built his spiritual life. If somebody can play with the things of God and take it lightly, you are carrying him to come and manage whatever. You are placing Satan over, over the affairs of the church or over people.
Number six. Look at this part. Let this first be what? Nah, I didn't hear you. Let this first be what? Uh-uh, I didn't hear you. Let this first be what? Listen, my friend. You're, you're, you're going to distribute something like financial administrators over the chapter. You see all this root, all this joy, all this will do. Some of these people sometimes will go hungry. They are broke. But they will still not touch church food. You see all these ones that are proven. See all these ladies that have born there. There is something there because it's wanted to bring somebody you don't know. You don't. When I, I show you in Numbers 11, he said, leaders who you know. That these are people that time has proven. Not beginners. The beginners should be made functionaries under this one so that they can bring report. That's why you should have performance standard and report. And after time, we we'll know who has made the criteria we can put him in charge. And you can go to bed and know him. The thing is inside him. The kingdom is inside him. You see all this one, like I've sat in our finance department for years and all of that. Let me give you a secret. When a pastor has somebody in admin or somebody in finance and something is missing there, he will know. He might not catch you, but he will know. You know, in spiritual environment, unless you are dealing with a man that doesn't have any sense of. That's why I will show it to you in Acts 6. The Bible said they must be of good report. Another thing is that somewhere, somewhere, if time has passed, brethren has a way of knowing. Especially the ones that work with that. That means, if, for example, our office, you want to know who this guy is, ask the 120 priest. Interview those people who work in the office. They will give you his character. What it means is that this is not just something you do without checking records. You don't just close your eyes and do it. Say you are listening to the Spirit. No. But there are seven tests of greatness. What people do when they are in lack, when they are broke, can tell you a lot. And what people do when they are in plenty can tell you a lot. An example is somebody that does not tithe consistently. You go and carry him and put over, over whatever. Who, who does? In this ministry, no office must be occupied by anybody who doesn't have a proven track record of tithing. Another one is paying and redeeming vows. You can't do that one. You want to come and do, do whatever. If you have only seven decades, they can manage the church well. And you can grow from there. So you see that the next quality is people that have been proven over time. Before you put them in charge, make sure they have worked under where some form of leaders have observed them over time. If you follow these criteria, principles that I'm listing for you, you will not have problem. Because the problem is not the structure you are developing, it's the human beings that will drive it. It's the human beings. So from the one, you have to set certain standards that must be your policies. And you have to state core values that must govern what you are doing. You know that policies, you can also put beside it, standards. Some people call it laws or operational laws or whatever. So that you do this one, you are gone, you are sacked that day. Or you do this one, we are going to take you to police. You do this level. Let this be proven first. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found what? So after they've proven over a period of time, you can stipulate what is it, how long? Is it one year? Or is it six months? Or is it whatever? And you know, if you say something like a short period of time, you can be fooled. 
It's something about time. After a while, people relax. Even if they know from day one, after a while, they relax. Even Big Brother, where you know, you know that camera is before you, you can pretend for the first few days. After a while, you relax. Your true nature will start coming out. So, let me make it clear. When you want to appoint people to some of this, ask questions about other people they've worked with. Ask for whatever. I'll show it to you now. But being found blameless, you can now set them in the office of a deacon. And verse 11. Did you see the other side? Once they are married, watch this side. So, because sometimes the man is good, but his wife is where the problem starts. Now, am I correct that in secular organizations like banks, if a lady was working in it and a man was working and they start dating and they are getting married, one will have to leave. Is that? Because when two people connive like Ananias and Sapphira did in the early church, it's a very dangerous thing. So their wives must be what? Grave. Number two, not slanderers. You know people who gossip, who talk horror. Number three, they must be sober. Number four, they must be faithful in what? Verse 12. Now we are still going back to the... So you notice that the next thing in that is the quality of person they are married to. The quality of the life of the person they are married to is very critical. The character of the person they are married to. Because it affects what that person finally will do one day. They caught one one uh, man uh, was stealing in Winners Chapel. He said it was his wife. The woman put pressure and it took two years before he caved in. You are busy counting all these millions and all that. And they just pay you this peanut. Because winners still pay 70000 pay 50000 They even have people they pay 20000 And it's a multi-billion setup. So when they look at billions passing every Sunday, Now, look at this part. Another qualification for the deacons. The deacon must be husband of one wife. So, you know, it means he must not be polygamous. Then the other one is that he has his family in order, ruling his children and their household well. He must have his family in order. It's not just children. His marriage, his family must be in order. Then, verse 13. You see the benefit of serving well in this office. They that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and a great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. What happened is that that office, if you serve there well, you usually get promoted into bigger things. Either in the five-fold purpose of the church or in the seven spheres of society. If it's somebody that handles church admin well, God puts him in government. He does that he might one day make him minister of education. Or he moves them like he, Philip was made evangelist. He starts moving in the direction of the fire. Because that thing is just a place for div- moving you to other bigger things. It's either in the society or in the church. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now, verse 14. These things I write unto you, hoping to come unto this shortly. You know, the apostle is setting the pattern, just like I'm trying to do for you guys. And look at 15. That is where I, I end this thing. He said that if I tarry, in my case, I said that even if I'm dead this night, I'm no more. If you don't see me again, you will know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, which is what? The pillar and the ground of truth. Do you know what that last statement means? The church is the institution that upholds values and morality in every society. 
So if we in, the government inside the church gets corrupt, there is no hope for society. We want them to stop stealing in Abuja, stop stealing in Laos, stop stealing. If the church that is the, uh, the pillar that upholds the moral standard in every society is the conscience of the nation, is messing things up this way, then society is finished. Because we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. You know how you ought to behave yourself, how things ought to be done in the house of God, in the church of the living God, which is a ground. And don't let a Judah survive here. The issue is that you people must set the system that will catch up with any of such people. If you have to put cameras in church, put it. If you have to use any principle, don't assume that they are not there because they are there. I'm warning you now. If you think you're wiser than me, we will see. If one grew under Jesus directly, you think it's this thing I'm teaching, that they cannot grow under it. You don't know anything. If one with the Father in heaven grew under him directly, by the name of Lucifer, you think I have special revelation that the Trinity doesn't have, that one cannot grow here. Some people get so close to God that it doesn't have a impact on them. Some people get so close to pastors, it doesn't have effect. Some people get so familiar with the word, it doesn't change them anymore. At that moment, these are in the kingdom, but they are criminals. Now, what kind of values will govern your admin? Then you set your vision this. What kind of values are you going to set now when you have seen all this? I think one more scripture I'm supposed to give you is Acts 6, from verse 3. You know, this is where they chose the first deacon, actually. Okay, let's actually pick it from, from verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, because usually you start ministry with much, a little headache. But as you grow, you have to set structure. When growth started coming, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Jews, the Hebrews. Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve, the apostles, called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not, it doesn't make sense. It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That is what they were advising Moses, I read for you. So verse 4. Look at what they said they are to give attention to. And when you do your job, you will enable us to focus on that. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to what? Prayer. And what? The word. If you read uh, Exodus 18, you will see the two things. But there are four listed. One is, be to the people God word. That's prayer. That you might bring their causes to God. Two is, teach them the laws and ordinances of God. That's the word, the ministry of the word. Then three is, show them how they are to live their life. Show them the way they must live. Four is show them the work that they must do. I'm showing you your job now, your work. Uh, but the, the other ones, we're going to deal with men, we're going to deal with a lot of other groups, because everybody has a role to play in the body. Show them the work they must do. So we, spiritually, they will give ourselves to prayer. And the saying, please, the, you know, the whole multitude, and they choose. But go back to verse 3. That's the part you need to look at. Three criterias they listed there. Brethren, look out among you for seven men. The first one is what? Honest. Honest. I told you credibility is a very serious issue. But now, beyond credibility, the apostles also expanded to include things like what's their reputation and character? Now, the people who believe in congregational version of leadership are actually building their doctrine from here. Now, the apostles did not choose these guys. They told the brethren to actually, and it's very important that you take note of that. It doesn't mean now that the congregation is running the church. But what it means is that when it comes to this supportive ministry, so you have to get feedback from the people that, that are working with, the people that know them, because 
I have noticed that somebody like me, everybody says sent in my when they see a me pastor. Once I'm around, everybody is good. Everybody is nice. Nobody gets angry. Nobody can curse. And nobody steals. And there is nothing like eye service. Everybody is hardworking. So you see, honest report. Number two is full of the Holy Ghost. Why? I said, what has Holy Ghost got to do with admin? The Lord said they have to be spiritual. I showed you the other place. He said they have to be men that fear God. The other side said they, uh, they have to hold the mystery of faith in a good conscience. They also have to have a very serious spiritual life. Somebody said, I don't care. Marriage is carnal. There's nothing spiritual about marriage. Once, you know, I said, okay, marry a carnal wife. Soon now you will see the, the, the impact of spirituality on marriage. Marry a husband that is carnal, and you will soon see the difference. And the last is full of wisdom. Full of wisdom. Now, we say competence, but I also want to bring another dimension why they pointed the word wisdom here. If somebody is running a business, and he ran his business down, don't give him the church business to go and run. If somebody is doing, has a company, let's check whether he's productive, whether he's... This, where you're talking about, we are getting some of this from the marketplace. We have to bring competence in. If somebody was working and they sacked him, why did they sack him? Is it because he's uh, uh, serving God and somebody didn't like? Or is it because he comes late? Is it because he's sloppy? Is it because he's, you know, he has problems with respecting authority? You need to find out why that guy has been losing jobs. You don't go and carry him and put him in the house of God. Of course, the same way the Bible says he must be of good report. I can show you where the Bible says they must have good report of them that are without. That means even the unbelievers that know them, what do they say about them? So if you go to the yard where they live, on the environment where they live, what is the kind of reputation they have there? The, guy, the girl is smelling. The guy is, is, you know, and you carry him. That's why the world don't have respect for the church. Because ordinary political parties know that to win an election, they won't put such a man. In case you don't know why, you know, the North ended up not choosing IBB. The argument they were making for him is that this is track record, delegate, what all you win for. We, we not. But they ended up choosing somebody like him. That they felt that he, he fought on Basan Joy, he did all that, fought third time, that Nigerians will likely support him. And that as a politician, he seems to understand the terrain. Because he kept arguing with them. Experience is important. Experience. I agree. But character is also important. Have I made your job more complex or made it easier? I want to know. Are you sure? It's much easier. I'm at find these Dominion City children that we have developed over the years. All this Chekiwe. Is it Chekiwe? Chekakwas. All this Lady D. All this uh, Nonye Ubueli. All this uh, uh, happiness. All this. Go and find them. There are people that we have developed. And you people should train them for admin purpose. A skill that they need. Some of them have not had those whatever. Some all their life have been it. All this bar barrister joy. All this whatever that we have known over the years. Go and bring them. All this when you knew when you were. And because for now, what is going on is that the admin people will be treated like ministry and we're going to post them to the chapters. If the man we have there doesn't have whatever, if the one they bring to you for training is good, good. After you train, you confine him according to the standard. It's no more what he used to be. That's why we are coming of age. There are eight things that must be standardized now. Of course, in Christ's embassy, they now post these people from their headquarters to the different whatever. Some too are pastors' wives. 
some are. What they have been able to innovate is that if you're going to use a pastor's wife, then let it not be in the chapter where the husband is the pastor. It's either he's in a base where he's assisting a senior pastor just for accountability purpose. These sisters we have developed, these people that have passed, have proved. Look at all, all these people. This Sunday, you leave strange people you don't know, managing your offering. If you know what has been going on there. Last year, I've been warning you. God has been warning me. And there is no way you can do this in around spiritual environment. We won't know. The only thing is that we may not have set the trap to. Jesus knew that Judas was stealing all the while. He left him until the thing killed him. All oh, this lady, like, what's that small uh, dark that wears glasses? Is he a kid or all those kind of ladies? Check people who have sacrificed to see the kingdom of God go forward in different ways. Who have shown faithfulness in the family. Bring them, teach them, because admin is a skill. Yes, I know that there are some people who have the natural firmness to like happiness and some others, you know, but it's also a skill that can be learned. And then with systems and performance uh, principles and monitoring systems, you can get people to, to line up. Especially when you now understand that under it that there are different arms. It's not just about finance or programs. There's projects, all kinds of things there. And then from the graduating sets in the university, you can always talk with the campus pastors every camp meeting, every time. Reliable people they have in their system. Sharp people who have skills, IT skills, some of the basic skills, and you always bring them and start training the next generation. You know, they will come and start working under and gradually grow and replace them after being proven. So by the time they are there, six months or whatever, you start getting all kinds of reports. Did you see just what happened with tapes and books? How they brought in some guy, uh, 120, whatever, and he would travel to some place and disappear there. At one time, we almost used police to go and collect him. They would be calling him root and others, whatever. Because the issue is accountability. People want to operate without accountability. Don't near the things of God. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. You can't go to any organization and get any type of whatever where you will not be accountable to somebody. I'll give you guidelines now. Seven guiding core values that must guide the Ministry of Administration. If you've been reading the things, number one, there is the issue of credibility and and integrity. The other words like trustworthiness, reliability. Other words like faithfulness, they define the same thing. Take note of that. It must be, and you must teach your philosophy as part of your training. It's a course. The philosophy of this place. That these are things, are no go area. You violate this area. Number two. Competence and excellence. I have other words you can use. You can use capability. You can use skill. What competence? You have to know what you are doing. 
you have to, the person has to be somebody who have, don't go and put on IT, somebody who says it's because he's spiritual. It doesn't make sense. And of course, he's going to fumble. Number three, spirituality and godliness. The person must be a discipled person. The person must have reverence and the fear of God. We said such people must be virtuous. Virtuous people are people who are morally sound. That's what we mean there, morally sound. How many have I mentioned? Three. Three. The fourth I want to give you here is wisdom and discretion. Prudence. Some people just don't have it. That's why they say, brethren, looking for men that have these qualities. Why are the apostles saying this? Because they know everybody doesn't have it. Why are you telling us to look if everybody has it? Some people are just very foolish. They don't know what to say, what not to say. People come, they are asking questions, they open their mouth and be saying all kinds of things. They don't know that there is such a thing as information management. There is such a thing as classified information. Wisdom and discretion. Prudence. Prudence. Common sense. They say if common sense is common, mad people will not be mad. I only name two because I can see how you are naming. You can put in bracket under. I just named two things. You know, in bracket you can put all, all the whatever. Number four. Number five. Transparency and accountability. Or you use the word probity and accountability. If you don't want to be accountable, if you don't want people to come and check records, check you or whatever, you are not ready for this kind of job. This kind of job is a job that anybody, anywhere, and you must keep accurate records. You must keep records. You must keep records. It's part of what... You know, desist. It's commitment and hard work. What we mean is that we are looking for diligent people, but we are also looking for committed people. Add it there. Diligence. As part of what you put in bracket, diligence. Number seven. Which is very critical. I should have even made it number one. is loyalty and submission. It's to authority now. It's to authority now. It's to authority It's loyalty to authority. It's also loyalty to the vision of the ministry. Now, you can now go and look through it and look at the scriptures relating to your, uh, you know. Um, I didn't put things like compassion here because that's not what we are looking for. If it's welfare ministry, you'll be seeing such values. It's not compassion we're looking for here. It's character that we're interested in here. Is competence that we are interested in. Is wisdom, because that area requires people who have, you know, discernment, such things that we are looking for here. Wisdom and discretion. You can put there prudence and discernment. Those are the things we are looking for here. Yeah. 
Now, I put on the side, you know, um, I did not put it in this whatever, but let's assume somebody is looking at other whatever. There is this thing about documentation. This thing about documentation that needs to become a value, a core value. Don't come to talk to me, tell me stories. I want to see where it was properly. And even when you are looking for, for example, somebody once said, a pastor told me, gave me permission to travel, to go and see my mother. Tell him where is the written whatever. It doesn't show it. Give him the maximum punishment. Even if you can prove it that I told him that. Still give him the maximum punishment. So you people need to write number eight, asterisk. You need to know where to fit it in. You need to know where to fit it in. You need to know where to fit it in. When I said competence and capability, I said on diet in bracket, put excellence. I actually said competence and excellence. You know, the reason is if that culture of doing something well, some, somebody will come, you have access to go and do Hambi. This program planning, it will bring one thing, you can't see picture, you can't see the word. Uh, he has to return it and he has to, he almost know that in this kind of place, you cannot bring that kind of thing. We say go and make furniture. He go, he go and do one thing or supervise project for us. He go and do one thing. What you must know that he will pay for it. Let's put those things down as policies that in this organization will not pay for that work and we will not accept it. You can't come and put it on us. Tell us you will pay for it. It's when you ha he, he, you know start rewarding people who leave organizational culture and punish those who don't that the culture becomes a lifestyle if not, nothing is done about it, you just leave it it will be on paper you know it will just end on paper finally on the same thought i give you seven guiding covenants for administration you will need to produce a covenant document. You have seen Dominion City Church covenant. that So that the day you tell me now, whether it's your next meeting, or you tell me that you are ready today, we will serve communion and inaugurate the team. When you get me the, the, the immediate whatever, I'm going to ask that you start with a, maybe a 12-man team. If you have more than that, that is not bad, but start with possibly a 12-man team. And you do the documents, and they have studied, and they agree that they will abide by it. Then we we'll come and serve communion. We we'll swear them in, and then we transfer the authority so they can actually do this job. We we'll can go and face our life. You know, it's the same way you swear pastors. You don't swear pastors casually. They are out of office. They are also out of office that goes with decades. And it begins with the uh, the you know, the basic ones that go with any type of church government. What are the three basic ones that started? The first is the oath of obedience and submission. It's a, a, a vow to submit authority. It's a very important vow. The next, the Catholic Church call it the oath of poverty. We don't do poverty or it's financial integrity. To carry out your destiny with Absolute integrity and probity. Never to have anything. It's a vow. It's a vow. Discharge your duty with integrity and honesty. The third. Is the one that has to do with loyalty to the Lord himself. Usually it can even be the first, which is the commitment to fear God and to remain loyal to Christ, to obey him. Because once a person is keeping that one and is obeying the Lord and living the scripture, it will affect how he handles any other thing to do discharge this duty with the fear of God and with loyalty to Jesus Christ. 
The next is a vow to protect and preserve the purpose and the mandate of God committed to this ministry. Not to do anything to deter or to embarrass or to cause any problem to that. You know what we are here to do. Protect it. Protect it. Protect the purpose of God and the mandate that God has committed to this ministry. The purpose and the mandate that God has committed to this ministry. Next to that is to protect and to help the set man or the visionary accomplish that mandate. Jesus said it this way. Whosoever has helped, uh, whatever you do to the, these ones in my name, you have done it for me. You cannot help God and destroy the man of God. Neither can you help God and destroy the church of God. The third protection is to protect the church of Jesus Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. There are three things to protect. The vision, the visionary, and the church. There are three things. The vision. The visionary, the set man. And I said the next is to protect the church. Your oath is an oath to protect the church. At all costs. Sometimes it could be legal. Somebody encroaches on your land. Sometimes it could be in other ways. It could be media. Your vow is to protect the church. Your vow is to protect this mandate. It's a commission to protect this commission. Because this is the vehicle God uses to accomplish his will. You cannot love Jesus and destroy his church. Number three, uh, uh, the second I said is to protect the set man. And then the final part is to assist the local pastors to carry out their work effectively. Because by doing your part, they will be able to focus, like we have read in the scripture, on the core operations. To carry out their work effectively by lifting the burden of administering the affairs of the church. There is still one thing missing because there are seven I have in my paper. I don't think we've got it uh, in order that I stated it. Let me be sure. Let me just list it. When you write it, we will now see what you are missing and where you missed it. The, I think it's even, whether it's the sixth or the seventh, is to develop and deploy an efficient to develop and deploy an efficient vehicle or administrative structure. You can do bracket with his systems and processes that will enable this ministry accomplish his mandate to develop and deploy an, eff an effective or efficient vehicle, I just use the word vehicle, or administrative structure that will enable this ministry to accomplish its mandate. So there are seven in all. Hmm? I want to know what you listed twice. No, look at the first, the first one. A vow to carry out their work with integrity 
and the fear of God. It looks like you wrote integrity and, and, and fear of God twice. With integrity and the fear of God. It's written twice, is it not? Huh? In bracket, with loyalty to Jesus Christ, with loyalty and obedience and to Christ and to what he stands for. Commitment to carry out their work with integrity and the fear of God. Every other thing is just explanation of that. If I think that usually should be the number one, then the second is the oath to of obedience and submission to the authority set up in this ministry. Or you just say to spiritual authority. Is that the best way to say it? You would need to now discuss it and find the right way to frame it. If you can leave, if you think it's all right the way you have done it, when you finish, because you need to discuss it before you swear it. Because we're going to administer it to you. So discuss it. Can it be more than seven? It can be. But, um, you know, I just gave you a guiding, you know, seven guiding covenants for administration ministry. So, for example, somebody who thinks that collaboration is important and teamwork, you think that is also, you know, um, you know, eh? uh -huh. so whichever way, you know, I have done the part that I'm supposed to do to help you. Two more things, it won't be, I won't bother you again until the next time I know you are having another meeting. But, uh, uh, let me read a scripture as I end. Zechariah 13, verse 6. Please take note of this. Is it three or, f or four scriptures that I'm going to show you? Take note. You know what your problems, the challenges, the, the, the whatever is. You also know why you need covenant to drive this. Why you need covenant. Zechariah 13 verse 6. And what shall say unto him, what are these wounds in your hand? That is when Jesus returns. Chapter 12, 13, and 14, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. When he returns, he will still be carrying the wounds of the cross. And then somebody will ask him, what are these wounds in your hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my what? In the house of who? Who are the people that gave Jesus the wound? Eh? Do you know the person? Judas. His brother and his friend. And when Judas came to betray Christ, he did it with a kiss. And Jesus said, Friend, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. That is how it is now. The people that have the ability to leave an indelible wound because this wound in the house of your friend never heals. That's the mystery of this type of wound. It's different if an enemy does something. It's different if the media is the source of attack. It's different if Muslims are the source of... When it is the people you have entrusted with things, that is the issue. These, give me another translation. Then he shall answer. 
these are the wounds I was wounded in a, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Another translation. Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Another one. Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Another one. He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. The question now will be, your friendship with Jesus, is it to hurt him later? To hurt his church that he purchased with his blood? I showed you yesterday, the church can continue without you. Because it's not the real ministry. It's just the structure to help assist, get the job faster. I show you in God's value system where it stands. And there are a lot of great ministries that men of God have lived in history, done tremendous without knowing all this your talk. Because the human beings are more important to God, and His message He has given us to deliver is more important to Him, and His purpose and His kingdom that He wants us to establish is more important to Him. Now, thank God for systems and structure. If you look at God's value system, it comes at the fourth level, second to last. The only other thing that it has more value than is the material things like all these tables, money, and all the material things. But you don't put it above people. Neither do you put it above God's word. Neither do you put it... Now, hear this. These are the wounds I was wounded in the house of my friends. Add this scripture to it. Psalm 55. Verse 12. Watch that. It was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have taken it. I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me. See rebellion, where it comes from. It's not my enemy or he that hated me that is now rebelling against me or magnifying himself. Then I would have hid myself from him. Verse 13. But it was you a man my equal, my guide, my acquaintance. When you read it, give other translation. Let's look at this so that they will see what it is. But thou a man as my equal, my familiar friend, my acquaintance. You heard that it's somebody that knows you that kills you. Eh? Now watch, another translation. But it is you, a man who is my pair, my companion, my good friend. When we teach on the cross, the most Jesus personally told me, he said the most damaging part of what he suffered are two. One is when his father has to turn his back on him. The other is when a friend, a Judas, man that is in charge of money, the one he put in charge of money, is this thing you are coming to do. You don't get the values right, it leads people to betrayal. They betray God, betray ministries, betray leadership. That's why before you start bringing it, you must teach the philosophy of this whole thing. You must. Because he will destroy some of them and send them to hell like he did to Judas. Now watch. Now go back to King James. It was you. My equal, my guide, my acquaintance. Yes, verse 14. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in company. Did you see the person that does this thing? That you come to church now doesn't mean anything. If you don't get these right values in you, and that's why you can't do this without covenant. You don't come into any of the three levels of the holy order without covenant. So that when you start, you reap what you have sold. You serve God faithfully. You obtain a higher degree. Have you seen how spiritual things are? Have you seen how it is? A man who took sweet counsel together because he's the person you have shared all the things. You have seen your secret. He's the one that can go sell it to media for money. Or he's the one that will come out to one and start rebelling. He's the one that will come out. You see? Go on. Go on. Show me other translations of that. We used to have close fellowship. We walk 
with the crowd into the house of God. Continue. Continue. Another translation of it. We who held sweet intercourse together to the house of God, we walked amid the throng. One more translation and I will leave it. We had loving talk together and went to the house of God in company. That's the person that has capacity. Now, why is covenant needed? Because the moment you start bringing people close, start bringing and expose them to information, you have created vulnerability, whether it's in organization or in normal relationship. That's why God wants covenant in marriage. But the person that has gotten that close to you can be the one that can harm you the most. Can do to you what an enemy cannot do. And look at the kind of consequences God said will come upon people who do that. Look at the next verse. I don't really have the time to. If you read down, you'll see from verse 15. Let the hand of death come on them suddenly. Let them go down, living into the underworld. Because evil is in their houses and in their heart. Another translation. That's it happened to Judas because he fulfilled exactly what he's talking about. Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwelling and among them. I'll give you one more scripture on that. You know, um, Psalm 41, verse 9. Am I making your job more complex or making it easier? Eh? Are you sure you still want to be in the admin? Eh? The truth is that have the people who love God, they will protect God's purpose, protect the work of God. Get the wrong people there, you have helped Satan. Because the devil hates the church just like he hates the owner of it. He hates God. So he's looking for a way. But God said the gates of hell shall not prevail, but he also set standards. You know? Okay. Yeah, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's what Judas did to Christ. Verse 10. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me and raise me up, that I may requite him. Verse 11. By this I know that thou favorest me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. Go back to verse 9. Check it in another translation. Even my dearest friend, in whom I had faith, who took bread with me. Remember that it was for communion that the guy went and sold him. He turned against me. Verse 10. But you, O Lord, have mercy on me, lifting me up so that I may give them their what? Jesus said, Woe unto that man. It's better for him that he was not born, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Betrayer is unforgivable in the church. The penalty is death. The penalty is death. And I want to warn you you do this, you are going to also pay the same price. Because, of course, you know me. I'm a small little boy. I have no business. I want to contribute my part and find my way. Church belongs to Jesus Christ. Whatever you think you are doing, you think it's human beings you're dealing with, it's Jesus and his purpose that you are dealing with. And there is penalty for that. There is penalty for that. Jesus said, Lord, have mercy on me. Raise me up so that he can have his just recompense. And of course, he was raised from the dead and Judas went to hell. Judas went to hell. You cannot destroy the church and go to heaven. You can't. You can't. You can't. Paul said, the reason I was forgiven is that I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was a Saint Henry then and he was persecuting the church. He said, but God showed me mercy. I can show it to you because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. It's like the Muslim now persecuting. If you ever get saved, they can forgive. But you that is inside the body, Last scripture, Acts chapter 20. Verse 25. So, Pastor Sarah, I don't know, because I know days are coming. You won't be able to get me to some of these. This thing is the most important thing, not all these functional parts. If you get the right people, guided by the right principles, they will deliver. 
and the church will grow and have rest. Now behold, I know, this Paul, the apostle, he has raised elders, he has raised deacons. Now he gathered the elders of the church in Ephesus. He said, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. One day it will be my turn. Mm -hmm. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. The next verse. For I have not shown to declare unto you the full counsel of God. At least he has done, if you remember the four responsibilities of leader, he has done it. When, once we have taught you, we have done our part. Whatever you do now, your blood is on your head. If I have not taught you, because you will be claiming before God, I didn't know, God will be holding me accountable. So, that's the same way that I'm free from your blood. In the same way the day we ordain pastors, these are the kind of things we show them. Now watch, verse 28. Take it therefore to yourself and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you over. Say, remember we say protect the church of God, life of human beings. Have made you over to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. The church is what Christ died to purchase. He didn't die to purchase systems. Hmm. Human lives. If you start a gossip or something that ends up destroying people, remember you will pay for it. Anybody who causes one of these least of these that believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that he's not born. Jesus said it's better that a stone is hung on his neck and that he, he this. Be careful what you say. Verse 29. For I know this that after my departing, you see shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the frog. Now, we know that the attack that comes to the church comes from two angles, external and internal. You will see it here. There will be external. Sometimes they are invited preachers. That's why before you invite anybody, all those people, you must get clearance from us. There are things people say with, they curtail themselves when the presence of leadership is there. Paul is telling them, once I'm out, you see, there are things, even if they are invited, just because I invite people to come and preach, doesn't mean all of them love you as Dominion City. But in my presence, there are certain things they cannot try. Because of course, whosoever, they, over the years, if you, if you have been around, you must have seen me. You must have known who I am. There is something God gives to the apostolic authority for the protection of the flock. That rod, we use it against lions and wolves. But once the leadership is not there, is not present, there are some people, if you drag me here, he will say some kind of thing. He cannot say in this star. If I'm sitting there, he can't try it because he won't have legs to leave that place. If he comes, if it's our opportunity to exploit the people financially, he will do it. He doesn't have anything binding him. He's not involved in your church covenant. It's like go and bring one person and leave your grown up daughters with him. Travel abroad and come back. If you won't have those that are pregnant and those that are whatever. You will know the difference between a father or a brother and whatever. I know that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you and reach you. They don't spare the flock. We have seen enough already. If I tell you what we have seen in this little journey we have made in a few years. And some are preachers. Verse 30. Then the other group. These ones come from outside. Here is the one that come from inside. And the most dangerous is these ones that are my familiar friends that are from inside. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. I, I want to tell you, if in heaven where God is supervising, Lucifer could do it. If on earth where Jesus was teaching, Judas could do it. You think Dominion City is proof to that. If Paul, he happened on that Paul, you think I have a special revelation I have invented that, can, that cannot happen. You are fooling around. Then you don't know your responsibility. It's like parents who assume your children cannot be abused. Somebody cannot mess up. You don't put protection in that house. 
you are fooling around. You don't understand your responsibility as parents. Leave them to be running around with boys in the street. Then soon you will learn yeah, the lesson of your own self. Of your own self. There are people who are with They sit down where there's a strong leadership. You see them, it calms the exercise. They sit there. You think they, are, they have submission. Give them small things. That Absalom in them will start coming out. Some will speak against authority. Some will find where they caught one stupid revelation. They just want to create so that, what is it? Verse 31. Therefore, watch. So, admin, in admin, you have to be watchful. Watchful is, watchfulness is um, vigilance. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And the fact that he did the warning doesn't stop it from happening. But the system they put in place is what can now check it. In verse 32. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Last. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 19. My advice for all of you who are coming to join with us in ministry, don't end up as servants or slaves. Make sure you are a son in the house. You won't have unnecessary problem. If the spirit of sonship is what guides you, you won't have all these problems. What produces these things is spiritual rejection that come from the spirit of slavery. The Bible calls it the spirit of bondage. He said, we have not received the spirit, of, the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of slaves, servant, is guided by fear. Somewhere along the line, they start finding a way. The sons are secured. The sons are secured. So I trust in the Lord Jesus to send. There are two people God, Paul recommended here, and he said they are sons. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, you see, shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Verse 20, for I have no man, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Now, Paul, Paul trained a lot of people. But it's the reason he's constantly talking about this one. One time he said, my dearly beloved son in the faith. For I have no man who is, who, who is like-minded, who will naturally care for your state. Verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. You train people. Don't ever think that if this could happen to Paul, and happen under Jesus Christ, that dominosity is removed from it. Then you don't have sense. You have no business in this calling. Don't ever believe that because I have maybe pastors now, sooner I have pastors, you go, that all of them actually are loyal to the, they are, in my presence, there are just some things. When a lion is around, there are just some things that can't happen. Until later. This is what Jesus Christ is facing. The wounds that are still hurting him today is coming from some of the people that have joined his church. If you are now coming into leadership, you must be trained to understand this thing. That spiritual warfare, demons in the heaven, demons in the air, is not the problem of the church. It's human beings that have allowed Satan to use them. And most of them are people that are nice people that you sit down and clap with them. And you can't tell if some of one of them or two of them are even here listening to me because it's, the talk is not the point. As we roll now, the future will prove it. For all seek their own, not the things which are verse 22. But you know the proof of him. You see, Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. 
make sure you don't stop with servanthood. Make sure you don't stop with just church membership. Remember, last year we spent a lot of time. I think there is a book on it. Make sure that that course, Catching the Spirit of, is a major course for those of you, everybody that will do any form of ministry. The five levels is one of the things I said I'm going to talk to you, but we will never be able to discuss it in details again. Make sure that these things are part of the things you teach. These are the things that are foundational. Children of God, children, don't ever put, the Bible says don't put these people in leadership. They are novice. Don't ever try it. Number two, members. No matter the skill this person has, don't put him in leadership. You will destroy his life. Number three, disciples. It is when people have been discipled that they are ready. If somebody has not gone through DLI basic and advanced, you know, even if you think he has wonderful, tell him to go and finish that first. Starting with yourself here now. Uh, even Phoebe, with all that she is doing, whatever, you check now. And this time around, they should be providing certificates to prove it. So if you have gone, go and get it. And they have not gone, send them back to go and do it. Very important. Because that hole that is in their spiritual life, that thing that they have not mastered will show finally in their behavior. Three is ministers. Four is ministers. Now, and then five is sons. Now, here is what I'm trying to point out to you. Once you have trained people, people get trained and empowered. Two groups of people will emerge. There will be those who come with the spirit of bondage. If you notice, they, they have characteristics. Did I teach this? I will show you. They have characteristics. They are afraid. Hey, Pastor, no see you. They are, they, when they are corrected, they take it wrongly. When they see correction or leadership as a threat, then you have those that have the spirit of adoption. The spirit of sonship. In the midst of angels, Lucifer moved into the fourth group. In the midst of the disciples of Jesus Christ, Judas moved into that. Thing. That thing automatically creates insecurity. They start thinking about themselves. They start thinking about their survival. They betray Christ. They betray the vision. They betray leadership. What drives the man there at this level is self. What drives this stage is self. These people are driven by sacrifice, service. You know, Jesus said, after you have done what is commanded, you say we are unprofitable servant. The attitude is not, they are not even making a big deal out of it. I have just done my part in the kingdom of God. It's no big deal. That group wants the spirit of bondage because sons are ministers, so. But there are two classifications. That's what we're trying to let you see. There are two types of ministers. There are those that have the spirit of adoption. This is my father's house. They relate to the set man as a father. It makes them relax and build. They know they're in their family. The other group, they are still hoping. Either they relate, they see you as their mentor, or they see you. Be careful about such people. Or they, are, they, are, they have this unsettledness about them. Some are looking for who they will use right on their soldier shoulder to rise. Some are looking for the opportunities. 
he always ends up destroying people. That's why we say wisdom and discretion. These are the part of admin that is not, uh, you see. Have you seen why the three words protect the purpose of God? Protect the visionary and other. Protect the flock for which Christ died. Protect what? They are external wolves and they are internal wolves. Satan will not get anything done till he finds people. Amen. 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 Don't assume that you have understood everything that I've said. Subject a lot of these things to prayer. Ask God to further open your eyes. Ask him to further make you the kind of person. And I actually want us to pray now. So there is no other time to do it. These are the real foundation that you need. Before that, your superstructure you're about to raise will now be raised on it. That's what will carry it. That's what will carry it. So when sometimes you bring people from the marketplace, they're walking into church, they say they're coming to help church to, casually, thinking it's a casual thing. And if they, you don't give them this proper orientation and other, before long, you see the same man who came in and said, he's wounded, he's, back, he's disoriented. Because he doesn't understand the kind of values that drive. The church is the expression of the kingdom of God on earth. That thing we want, God has done in heaven. He wants it done on earth. And we are the agency to get it done. See all these ones we have proven over the years that have gone through discipleship. They have been rebooked. You know they take correction. They have been whatever. They are the ones you need to get now and start this process with. Not some person that has flesh that nobody can talk to. That's where the offense started. Until people have been corrected, rebooked, whatever, you don't know them. The way you taste snakes, they come inside the church, there is a type of snake called Ada. You saw these ones, they said, men will rise from among you. Speaking perverse into drum and after that type of snake, they are called adder. They are very poisonous, but they can lie in a farm. You are cutting farm, they will lie there until you get close and march on it. Uh -huh. It pulls pop on your leg. It shows you its true color. Other snakes we even see as the people are making noise, they will be escaping to other. People. This one has ability to mingle, stay in the system. So what farmers have learned, they've learned how to get it out, to take off. You know what drives it? Bushfire. That's why when Paul and co. had shipwreck, they gather sticks and other. In Igbo and they call it a cheteka. What do you call it? Viper. Is that what you they call it? Is that what they call it? It was inside the stick. Can you imagine somebody went to carry a stick, carried a snake, it didn't move. That's, it has the ability to camouflage. They carried it, put it, it didn't move. But the moment they ignited fire, pia! Pooh! On, on Paul. That's what they do in ministry. They can lie low till they get themselves wangled, get to a level of leadership. Then you see their color, it will show. But let me give you a secret. What God has done by creating plurality of leadership is that you can fool one man, you cannot fool everybody. What he does is that when he says, look here among you, is that once you follow that principle, you can always catch these guys. Because people know them where they live. People know them. The highest thing you will say, church on Sunday, these are the seven, uh, twelve men we are planning to ordain into the office of a deacon. In about a month's time, pastor is going to be laying hands on them we call them to stand. Any of you that has any reason. You know the way you do it in marriage? Because the one that has wives, he has had a child somewhere. Sometimes they are not honest to say it. That God's one girl, pregnant somewhere, he won't tell you. And he want to leave her and come and wait another person. Or has done cut marriage in some other place. Or came back from you. Anybody who has any reason why any of this should not be ordained into the holy order into the office of a deacon, or office of a pastor. Speak now, because after that ordination, it is too late. 
and you are going to submit to them and you are going to obey them. Because once you start functioning, the rest of the church, that you are going to be taking your money to them. They are going to be the one collecting your vows. They are going to be the one administering them. If you have anything, say it. You, once you start finding people writing, this guy, and you start, the scripture said, investigate it, look it. Once there are two or three witnesses, once you start having two people, three people, witnesses, then you need to look into that case. There is something in it. And where it is followed, you will, it is hard for the vipers to hide. Fire is what reveals their true color. And fire is the book, correction. Sometimes trials. Sometimes they show who they are. They show who they are. They show who they are. I want you to come and pray for us. This whole admin project. Because it's a big project you're undertaking. And you have seen that the quality of human beings you get to help you do this is more important than the structure you are developing. So if you face and just the system, processes, and just do all the talk, you think it's a talk thing, finish. The quality of human beings you have is far more important than so you have to develop values, you have to develop policies. I expect you people to be meeting every week, or oh. all this one you're doing this three days. I expect you to be meeting once a week, like every other church, whatever, pastors meet once a week. I expect you to be meeting because you have a long walk, you have a long uh, uh, where are they? Uh, you have to develop policy. So that inside it, you put some of the, not only things that you, you even put the punishment. You can even state certain things that will be done if somebody maybe steals or so, 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 so. And somewhere you're going to put a disciplinary system plus a reward system. And then, it's the same thing now. You are going to use that because you are, you become our, you know, source of standard in the whole ministry become the, the source of salt. Okay.